not only go, but the hell go. rotational, vibrational, then magic happens. We turn it all into a statistical growth that kind of rebuilds everything we saw empirically, but from the fundamental point of view. All right, so we need to do the translation first. We're going to start with a one-dimensional, of course, we're going to make it into a 3D system. Part of your homework problem was to have, you know, breaking up a two-dimensional X and Y system into X Y individual. So what we're going to find is when we solve this system, all we have to do is to cube it, just make it cubed, add the energies three times, and we're going to have a, a model for a particle within a room, which is what we're after. All right, so we're going to start with this in here. So we've got a wall, then we have our free particle, which is distributed all around space. And the deal about the particle all in space, some of you picked up on this, is that the momentum of that particle was exactly known, but its position was entirely unknown. Unknown. All right, so what if we did two things. One, well, we, we, we did one, we're gonna do a second. One, we said, okay, let us limit the knowledge of how fast it's going. And what we found is that it localized the position. All right, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This is kind of the same thing but working in a different direction. Instead of allowing it to be over space, I'm going to put limits on it. I'm going to put a wall in place. Now the walls are, obviously this is an idealized type of thing, they're infinite on one side and infinite on the other. If these are not infinite, which we will see very soon, then the particle can exist in those areas. Good morning. All right, but we're going to make it infinite, which makes the particle non-existent in those particular areas. Okay? So now we're going to look at the particle within here. So first I want to find out, what does this particle look like classically? So imagine you're in space. It's a field-free environment. You have a localized box, and you set a particle in motion that reflects off the walls perfectly elastically. Not quite perfect, but we get pretty close to that. So when it bounces into a wall, no energy is lost into that wall. It just reflects back. What would you expect to see? What would be your vision of where that particle might be? This will become the answer. You're in space. Spaceship. No grab. You set a particle in motion in the box. What do you observe? Classic. If I asked you, what's the probability of finding a particle in the first one fourth of the box? How much time would it spend in the first quarter of the box? Of time. It's moving. It probably gets moving. Back and forth evenly. It's not accelerating. It's not decelerating because there's these elastic collisions against the wall. So any part of the box should be represented by one point of that time. It's a quarter of the box. Half of the time is a half of the box and so forth. That's a classical model of that. Well, that's kind of, I've, I've done this. I won't go over through this, but here are Newton's equations of motion where we have no potential at all. So the mass and the acceleration is zero, which gives us an equation of motion that it has a V zero T. And if I set initially the particle to start at zero, that goes to zero. So it's just it's a velocity times time, back and forth and back and forth. So it has an equal of probability of being in any particular region of space. We'll see what the quantum mechanics has to say about this. And we'll see if we can reconcile the differences. All right, quantum mechanically, in region here. Now, here, in these two regions, one and three, so I'll call them region one and region three, if I just kind of label them that way. 
will call this region two. The minus h bar squared over two m d two d. This is this is the Schrodinger equation. We were always going to return to, but plus infinity on psi is equal to e psi. This infinity problem makes it impossible for any probability that the particle will exist in this region. If this was not infinity, but it was a finite value, like for example, and this is, a, by the way, a model for integrated circuit chips. A model for an integrated circuit chip looks like this. You have something along these lines. So you have uh, chips on and off. So if there was a quantum particle within here, there is a probability that it can exist within this region. You kind of saw this on the exam problem. I had you, you know, find a quantum mechanical wave function for a particle that could exist in a region where the energy of the particle is less than B. That was a, an exam problem. And what you should have found, that most of you did, is that the wave function is was e to you had this kx and e to the minus kx. So you had these real exponential functions. What you should a few people picked up on this is in our model system, this is impossible because by the first law, this blows up to infinity. Right? But this one is possible. That means within a region such as this, the wave can collapse in that region and exist. This is going to be the basis for tunneling, which we'll see very, very soon. However, if I have an infinite region like that, forget it. No way the particle is going to exist in there, so we're going to have a boundary condition that will apply to it. So for this particular scenario, regions one and three, no question, we can answer the question immediately, psi is zero, it does not exist. Of course, the interesting part is what happens in between. So let's take a look at that. So in the interim area, where we have no potential at all, we're going to come across another differential equation that we've seen a hundred times. Well, not a hundred times, like 106 times. We have a minus h bar squared, twice mass, second derivative with respect to x squared on psi is equal to e psi. Okay. This was essentially somewhat of a three-particle type of a problem, except the difference here is that we have boundaries. Our boundary conditions are going to change everything. Rearranging this, I have the second derivative with respect to x squared on sine, just bringing this across, then plus 2me over h bar squared on size is equal to zero. I'm going to call that k squared. Again, we make it squared just for convenience. Because once we you know, find the solutions to this, it's the square root of that k that actually they can produce. All right, so with that in mind, here is one of the differential equations I introduced you to. We should just simply write down the solutions to that because this is a bound system. The preferred solutions are the sine and cosine solutions. We could do the e to the i k x, the e to the minus, it would work perfectly well, no problem, but the sine and cosine solution is just more convenient. So no problems with doing either. So psi of x then, writing is a times the cosine of what we have the square root of that k squared or kx, and b times the sine of kx. There's our general solution, of course, because we did two integrals implied within here. We have an undetermined coefficients a and b. All right, so now let's look at boundary conditions. We have to have finite, we have to have continuity. In this region, because of this finite potential, we know that the wave function is zero here, and the wave function is zero there. So the wave function must be continuous in this region through this arbitrary boundary. That means 
that we have two things in place. Psi at zero has to be zero in order for it to be continuous down within here. And psi at distance A also has to be zero. It can't exist there. So it has to be then that it drops to zero within this region. All right, let's apply the first boundary condition. For here's our general solution. For our first, psi at zero is zero. Well, that is A times the cosine of zero, K times X. And B times the sine of zero. So putting the positions in place, setting this boundary condition as it is, under what conditions is this true? Well, sine of zero is zero no matter what. But the cosine of zero is one, which leaves only one obvious decision. Because of this, A has got to be equal to zero. That's the only way for that to be true. So that determines one of our coefficients. We're ready to go. So now I have a new wave function. We know A is zero. So it ends up being B times the sine of kx. All right, so we reduced one of our undetermined coefficients to zero, leaving us with one more. This last coefficient, as is very, very common in the case, is going to be determined by normalization, is what we'll find out. However, we can find a little bit more information out about this because of the second boundary condition here. Now I have psi of a is zero, so let's put that in place. Psi of a is now b times now the sine of k times a, and because region three, the wave function cannot exist, it must be continuous, it has to be zero at this boundary, so psi at a has to be zero. So then we raise the question, under what conditions will the wave function at this point be zero. Well, we have two options. One is the trivial option. We can just, like we did here, we can set b equals zero, then there's no wave function, nothing exists, and so it's called the trivial solution. So we have to find conditions under which b is non-zero, but the sine of k times a is. So we have to ask ourselves the question, when is the sine function equal to zero in multiples of pi. So this will be true if either b is zero, trivial solution, or k times a is n multiples of pi, where n is an integer. Boom, we have quantized. We've now quantized our system. That was what I was telling you. When you put, it, you put a limit on a wave, quantization then appears naturally. So this is always zero if this, this term is n multiples of pi, or we find out then that k is then n pi over a. Now we have a yet as of yet unnormalized wave function that says it is equal to this coefficient b times the sine of n pi x then over a. In this case, is our m the quantity group of the other one? Mm -hmm. That is. Can n be equal to zero? Think about the uncertain principle of this one. N zero means that the wave function has a zero of energy, means it is static, it is at rest, which is a violation of the uncertainty principle. We can't have it. So N cannot be equal to zero, just from uh, a philological perspective. So N has values one, two, three, all the way to the end. We could accept the possibilities that n could be negative one, negative two, negative three, but as we saw in the other system, it's redundant. 
because in negative one and positive one will give exactly the same results. So there's our weight function. We have one yet undetermined constant, that's the B. We'll get that by normalization. So let's do that. So let me pull up my handy dandy. Helpful intervals, which I hope are. Okay. So these are what you're going to use. We're here, we're going to need these within here. So now let's normalize, get a wave function, then we're free to examine it. So now we have to have that one normalizing is now B squared integral from zero to A. That is all space for this system. It cannot exist past A. It cannot exist less than zero. That is all space. We have psi star psi. Our wave function is real. So it simply becomes sine squared of n pi x over a dx. So we'll get that. If set it equal to 1, we'll find our last value of b. Well, this then becomes b squared, rather than b round. And we have the sine of bx here. Of course, MathCAD doesn't allow you to put a square within here, so there it is right here. But the integral of this is x over 2, then minus 1 over 4 times b. Well, the b is the argument n pi over a, so it becomes times a over n pi. So there's your 1 over 4b. And then times the sine of 2 n pi x over a, we evaluate that from 0 to a. In this particular instance, look at the upper limit, look at the lower limit. If I put a 0 in for this x here, the sign is 0. If I put a in for here, it becomes a divided by a, it is 2 times multiples of n pi, which is a 0 as well. So this term, for all conditions, just goes to zero. For here, the lower term, of course, is zero. We're putting in zero. So we end up with a very simple result is that it's b squared times the length of the box, a divided by two. That is equal to one. So we find that b is the square root of two over a. So we've completed our quantum system. Our wave function is complete. So now we can write completely, no undetermined coefficients left, that psi, the wave function of the particle in the box, is the square root of two over the width of the box, or length of the box, sine n pi x over a. There is our wave function. We're done. Now all we need to do is beat on it Got to give us the information we want to know. So let's take a look at that. Going through, then, there's our solution. And here's our, everything we've done up here over all my boundary conditions and signing everything that we just discussed. And there's the normalization. Here we go. Now let's take a look at it. Okay, now the wave function itself, then if I plot that, this is for quantum numbers n equal one, two, and three. <coughs> Excuse me. In these instances, because we have a sine function, the sine function goes up, it goes down, and so we have positive and negative values. Well, the Copenhagen interpretation says that the probability of finding the particle is the wave function squared. This is a real wave function. We don't have to do a complex conjugate. So if I take the wave function for n equal 1, n equal 2 and n equal 3 and square it and plot it, we get something that looks like this. It satisfies the boundary conditions, all of them go to zero here and here, but classically the particle was evenly distributed across the box. What's the probability of finding it the first one-fourth of the box? One-fourth of the time. You took snapshots and did many, 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 many of them and you averaged them, it's what you would get. This doesn't say that quantum mechanically. 
It says the particle is never at the end of the box. It has most of its time in the center of the box and then less on the end. If we promote this particle to the n equal 2 quantum state, then you have a node in the middle, which sounds like you're saying nodes with a cold. So you have a probability of being right at highest in here, highest in here, and zero probability of being in the center of the box, which brings about an interesting question. I always love to pose this question. If the particle is in the n equal to quantum state, it has a zero probability of being in the center of the box. Raises this question. How should the particle, particle get from one side of the box to the other? If it can't exist in the middle, how does it get from the left to the right? There's no protection in the middle. There's no barrier there. How does it get from one side to the other? What's that? Is that the tunneling you were talking about earlier? Nope. Tunneling implies being in a region where classically it says you can't be. So if I had a high wall, I threw a ball at a high wall below the level of that wall, classically it says it's going to come back. Quantum mechanically it says there's a probability that it'll appear on the other side of the wall. Slightly different matter, but it's a good, it's a, it's a good promise. You have good thought. But like I said, there is no barrier to prevent it from more than one side to the other. I'll let you stew on that for the day. I'll give you an answer to that. I will tell you this, here's a hint. It's an illegal, throw a flag, put the white shirt on, blow a whistle, it's an illegal question. Think about that and see what you come up with on Monday. All right, so anyway, so if we have then, we promote to the n equal three quantum state, we have two nodes. Nodes are regions where the wave goes to zero. You know this already. Remember looking when you're in general chemistry and you're like this, I think you have your TQ orbitals, P orbitals, things like that. You know, like, like a second or third grade or something like that, like me. But your P orbitals look like this, if you recall. We're going to find out that that's a lie too. Wait till you see what a P orbital looks like. But anyway, in this region, you had the nucleus here, which had a zero probability of having an electron. An electron can't exist in the nucleus. So the question becomes, that's called a node. So you have a zero probability. So the particle being one side to the other, which raises the same question, how does the particle get from one side to the other? So what happened here, so whenever you have nodes, those are characterized by higher energy states. The higher the energy, the more nodes. Think about it. You have an S orbital, no nodes. A P orbital has one node. A D orbital has two nodes. An F orbital has three nodes. More nodes, higher energy. All right. So anyway, aside from that thing, the classical result says, uh-uh, that's not what we see. We can visualize this. I can take a ball, I can bounce it back and forth on a wall, and a space shuttle sitting in orbit. That's not what we see. So who is right? So we look at this. We see this probability within here. So let's do this. What I'm going to do is similar to a homework problem that you have. I'm going to go through that in just a second. Is I'm going to ask the question, what is the probability of seeing the particle in the first one fourth of the box? To do that, we integrate this b squared, I'll just say now 2 over a, because it's a square root of 2 over a squared. I'm going to have a sine now squared of n pi x over a dx. This is psi star psi, it's the probability. To find out the probability, of being in the first one fourth of the box, I will integrate from zero to a over four. If I integrate it from zero to a, I would get a certainty, I would get one. What's the probability to find the particle in the box at all? It's a certainty. But if I go to one fourth, it'll give me the probability of being in one fourth of the box. Well, let me do that. 
and I'm, I'll let you do the arithmetic on this one, but the result is a probability function that looks like this, and here's what is interesting. I have plotted, this is this probability, that is the result of this integral, of going from one-fourth of the box, where f is then one-fourth. So I have n, which is the quantum state. I have f, which is one-fourth. And if I plot this, look at what happens. That n equal one, the probability of being one-fourth of the box is slightly less than 0.1. For the n equal two, it jumps to about a little over 0.3. Then it comes down to just a little bit, 0.2, then up and down and up and down and up and down, zig, 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 zig. But look at where it ends up. It ends up at exactly 0.25 or 1 fourth. This is a demonstration of what is called the Bohr correspondence principle. It says that if you take quantum systems and you bring them up to classical levels, either by increased masses, increased energies, or whatever it may be, you bring the quantum system up to classical levels, you should get the classical result, which is exactly what we find here. By the time n gets to 150, then it is zeroed out exactly at 0 0.25, which is what we would expect. This is important because when we take a particle and put it in this room now, we're going to make it three-dimensional very, very soon. When we make our three-dimensional particle, our classical result, Boltzmann distribution, kinetic theory works beautifully, wonderfully well. Why does it work so well? Well, it's going to be this as a result. We're going to be up at quantum levels that are so high that classical rules apply. So the correspondence principle, we'll have to deal with that with every system that we solve. So there is the case in there, probably more important. Now, what I have for you in Problems number one and two. First off, problem number one. One of the things we dealt with was Hermitian operators. One of the things about Hermitian operators was that the wave functions are orthogonal. I had to demonstrate that in problem one. So in other words, I want you to, can I give you the part of the Yeah. So you'll do the integral over all space, zero to a, this is going to be again 2 over n, this is your probability, but you're going to have a sine n pi x over a and a sine m pi x over a dx. Two different quantum numbers. So these are, according to Hermitian operators, they should be orthogonal this integral should go to zero, if that's the case. Oh, what an advantage that is going to be. You'll see it very soon. So demonstrate that if I have two different integers, n and m, and you might, you know, there's several ways to do this. A Euler's relationship could be very helpful here. There's many, many attacks at this, but you should be able to show that this integral is zero, demonstrate it with orthogonality of the quantum solutions. Okay? Then, problem number two, we're going to play a gambling game. I say, all right, we, I demonstrated that this function right here, you know, we have this function of probability of finding one fourth of the box. We're going to do a very, very simple problem. What you're going to do is, I want to find the probability of finding, would you like, Integral you just wrote a two over a or two over b. Two over a. A is the, the width of the box. Uh, okay. okay, so yeah, two over a. Because the, the normalization constant is the square root of two over a. When you square the wave function, you get two over a. So two over a. Okay. But problem number two has you evaluate where you have x is a minus b. Well, what the heck would I have here? Um, Oh, I'm sorry, a over 2. So you have x is a over 2 minus some value b to a over 2 plus b. In other words, I want you to find an expression that will give the probability of finding a particle within a region of the box where this is, this is a over 2 
plus b and over here is a over two minus b. So I want the probability of b within this, within this region. Being that the wave function is symmetrical, you can make, so this one of course will be psi star psi dx. This can be, should be twice the integral from a over two to a over two plus some value b. And of course this will then be the sine squared of n pi x over a dx. And you can just use the integral that we've used before. Okay? You're going to have, of course, a, a normalization constant squared that you will account for. So you'll produce an expression that will tell the probability of being within that region. Then you go to the numerical realm, okay? Use MATLAB's numerical solver, use a solve block, given this to be true. So when you do this, and finally get this integral, you're going to have an explicit function. Then you can say, all right, we want the value of the probability to be 0 0.48. The problem B says, a Vegas casino sets up a gambling game where a particle in a 1D box has the device. It plays bets upon the measurement of the particle to be found within the distance B of the center box. And said, first I'd have you B plot the probability that the particle would be found within a distance B of the center of the box. So anyway, once, you, once you've done this integral, it's a straightforward one to do, do it in terms of N in general. Then you can plot those things with both the N equal 1 and N equal 2 quantum state. So I then, okay, in part C, it says the casino desires to fix the value of B such that the player has a 48% chance of winning an even money bet. So you will set this 0.48 equal to this n squared, 2n squared, integral from 0 to A, I'm sorry, from A over 2 to A over 2 plus B. Once you've done your integration. You put your sine squared in there. You'll have this function done. You'll be able to derive that explicitly. So then, in a solve block, set the value of that equal to 0.48 and find what value of B will allow the probabilities to be 0.48. Okay? And then, in part D, instead of the casino then, wishing to increase its advantage of the hidden device that excites the particle to the n equal 2 quantum state. If the device is used, what is the probability the player will win in this instance? So once you have the answer to this and a value for b that gives this to be true, then you place that value for b back in your function and see what probability come up when n is equal to 2. So you're going to find out there will be quite a quite a bit of the probabilities, as that tells you. Okay? So those are the first two problems on there that we can look at. All right, so then we want average values, which now we're going to beat information out of this wave function to find things that we want. So, as I asked, very first day, within the first two minutes of the course, how do you calculate an average? <laughs> then all of you struggled a little bit, but you said, okay, the value times the probability. So we want to find then the average position of the box. Well, this is going to be then a over 2, or square root, I'm sorry, 2 over a, sorry. 2 over a, square root of 2 over a squared. We want an integral from 0 to the length of the box, a. We have then the value sine squared n pi x over a multiplied by now since we're in quantum mechanics an operator. The position operator is simply the variable x. So there's my operator, then there's not sine squared, sine n pi x over a dx. Straightforward integral. We just go again to the handy dandy integral tables. Just pulling that up for the momentarily. Now we're going to do this value here. We have an x, then sine bx squared. We get this as a result. In producing that, 
We have then the average of x. So here's the result of the integral. We'll go through the detail on it. We have x squared over 4. Here we have another sine of 2n pi x, which is always 0. This is one that gives a 1 and a negative 1. So they add it out. So these two terms go from completely 0. They zero each other out. So we have 2 over a. Then I have a squared over 4. We, so we have the average position to be like in the middle of the box, which makes perfect sense. It's a symmetrical system. We can do the same thing with the momentum. So now I use the momentum operator. So I have my wave function normalization constant here. The wave function in N, here's my momentum operator from the second postulate. Wave function on here, I simply carry out this derivative, which so we've described, execute the operator, then combine and do the result. Here we have a sine n pi x over a, cosine n pi x over a. These two functions from 0 to a zero out completely. So if you use, again, the handy-dandy integral tables, you get a sine squared n pi x over a, which from 0 to a then goes to 0. So the average momentum is 0. Makes perfect sense. We would have equal probability that the particle traveling forward in the box and reverse the box. It's a perfectly symmetrical system. If you continue with this, which is a discussion for a later time, and calculate the average x squared, you get a result that looks like this, and the average momentum squared, the average square momentum, you get a pi squared h bar squared over a squared. Now we will do the uncertainty. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, based on the statistics that we use, says the average uncertainty in a position is the average square of x minus the average x squared, and the uncertainty in the momentum is similarly the momentum squared average minus the average momentum squared. Both of those, of course, are zero. So that's a over two, actually. So when I put those together and have the average distance, uncertainty, and the uncertainty in the momentum, combine those together, we get a constant, and we find out that the uncertainty principle holds. Uncertainty principle says the uncertainty in the position and the momentum has to be equal to or greater than h bar over 2. It is 1.136 h bar over 2, so it holds beautifully. Okay, so everything kind of comes into play then. Where are all the quantum mechanics to satisfy? The last thing here before we move on to some other, and you know, we can begin to build this up into multiple dimensions, is we talked about, unfortunately the video did not work, where you have the condition where if you allow the possibility that a particle can exist in multiple quantum states simultaneously, it's called a superposition of states. An interesting result comes from that, which answers a question that you had to about the Hermitian type operators. So let us say possibly that a wave function might be in a quantum state one and quantum state two. You have the normalization constants A and B, and when you add these probabilities together, you have to also ensure that the wave function itself is still normalized. So you're gonna have a normalization constant that follows that. So to do a normalization, I wanna take this, take the absolute square and integrate it. So that's gonna be n squared, the new normalization constant of the result. We will see this when we build up atoms and molecules in particular. Then I have a psi one, b psi two, that quantity is squared. Once you do the cross terms, you get the normalization constant, you have this coefficient here squared times psi squared, this coefficient squared, psi two squared there, and then you have two cross terms. You have two times this coefficient, that coefficient, psi one, psi two, that comes into here. There's your square. When you integrate that, thank you, Hermitian operators, you square that, you get an n squared, an integral, 
a squared psi one squared. Then you have this two a b psi one psi two. There's your integration, and then the b squared is psi two squared. This, because the operators are Hermitian, is zero orthogonal. This is normalized because it's one. That's your normalization constant. And then you have this psi two, which is one as well. So when you break all this down, it comes into just an a squared, that's a, norm, that's a normalized wave function one, zero, b squared, normalized wave function one. So you end up as follows. So you have the wave function itself. When you do this integration, you have simply the coefficient, the weight of that. How much is wave function one? How much is wave function two? What are their contributions? So A and B give that. Here's your normalization constant. So it comes in here. So the, then here's what it comes down to. The probability of being, let's say, in quantum state B is the coefficient weighting that divided by the normalization constant for B squared, A squared plus B squared. So once we have and here's what we're going to do later. We're going to find out that it is impossible to solve quantum systems that have multiple electrons. Here's what we will do. We will make a molecular orbital by combining atomic orbitals. So we're going to take a molecular orbital, we're going to have a 1s, we're going to have a 2s, 2px, 2bzy, 2bz, we're going to add all these things together. The coefficients that weight those will give us what the molecular weight function would look like. And we will know where the electron is, what is its weight function by the coefficients that come into play. So whenever I have multiple quantum state possible, the probability of being in any particular one quantum state will be the coefficient weighting it divided by the sum of the coefficients squared. So that's what we're going to do. Now what we'll do then is then expand that to our tunneling system, which is what we'll do next time. But I do want to make a point. The uncertainty principle still holds. So let us say now that I have a set of quantum numbers or quantum states states here, and I'm going to add quantum states together. Currently, I have one quantum state. This is the particle in the box quantum state. So if I have one quantum state, it's in the ground state, there is the wave function, what it looks like, what we saw up above. So let us say that I want to add quantum state n equal 1 to quantum state n equal 2 to 3 to 4. What does the wave function combined look like? So let me put in then, let's say, I'm going to add 10 quantum states together. We will see this, because the quantum states we're going to have available to us in a room is going to be on the order of 10 to 30. So it's going to be a very large number. But if I add 10 quantum states together, a superposition arrives, and look at the position. So here, with 10, I may ask the question, what quantum state is the particle in? I don't know. It's within one to 10, I have no idea. But does that gain me information? Yes, it localizes the particle. So it's that same, you know, we see something, we see. The more you know about one thing, the less you know about another. So the less I know about one thing, where the particle, what quantum state is in, the more I know about where it is located. So it's a, it's a superposition principle all over again. Let's make this instead of one to 10, let's make it 100. And you see the particle becomes even more local. So it's that quantity of that uncertainty Heisenberg thing all coming back on us again, the nature of waves. It's an unfortunate one, but there we go, there it is. All right, so what we will do next is that, okay, now I'm going to take my particle, I'm gonna have it bounce up against a barrier, and we know classically what's gonna happen. If it's gonna hit the barriers and bounce backwards. Quantum mechanically, what's it gonna do? We'll check that out next time. That'll be the telling probability that we will see. Right? We'll take that on. Okay.